So I was off mute this whole time, and now I just turned it on. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, well, I'm going to preface this by saying, just like I did the last three Sundays that I spoke over the last two months of... Um, what I'm going to do on Sundays when I share is not the typical, like, here's your sermon that you think of on Sunday mornings of, uh, like, our 1030. I actually, this is just my preference. Uh, this isn't like I derive this from biblical study or teaching necessarily, but I think the 1030 is, should be a time of, of uh, heightened worship, glorifying the Lord through the preaching of Scripture, um, which a lot of times seems less practical and more theological, but that's what uh, a lot of times preaching is in bringing the glory of Christ, of you know, exalting his, his worship and, and everything. And I like using the Sundays because, on the 930 because we call it a Bible study anyways, and so it's roughly a Bible study. It's not a sermon. And so I just say that for my own, uh, for my own mental state and maybe to help you guys and so we're just doing a lot of things that are like kind of really practical here on, on 9.30. Um, so everybody should have the foundational book list in their bulletin. Uh, that should look familiar. You should have seen this a hundred times if you've been here two or three weeks. Um, but so everyone's got a foundational book list. We can do head nods. We can do thumbs up. We can give a, yeah, I got one. We got a couple thumbs up. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. And so... Again, we're just going to do a lot of really practical things, um, and I'm going to kind of explain some things first, but before we get going too far, uh, let's pray. Uh, so Father, we come here this morning uh, admitting that we, we don't just need your help, uh, we need you to radically intervene in our lives, in our minds, in our spirits, uh, to give us a hunger for you, a greater knowledge of you. Lord, unless you revealed yourself to us, unless you told us and showed us exactly what you wanted us to know, we would never discover it. We would never come to maturity apart from your grace, from your gentle, leading, guiding hand. And we thank you for that, Lord, that we can cry out for help. We can, we can uh, understand you more. We can grow closer to you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, I always preface our like little practical things, like um, just to do a quick like overview of what we did uh, uh, the last two times, which we'll just well the last time we just went over the foundational articles list. Um, so we have a, a a list and a um, of resources to help you grow, and so. Uh, everybody, you know, every organization, every church does something like that, uh, that wants to help their people grow, whether it's uh, on your job, they usually go do like uh, ongoing training. Um, a lot of jobs do tuition reimbursement because they want you to get a higher education and uh, because that'll help their company better and uh, they'll have more knowledgeable employees to create a better product. Uh, which will be a greater business, which will probably give them more money or something. Whatever their end goal is, I don't know. Uh, but if it's a business, it's probably money. Uh, or a service or a resource or a product, right? And so um, our product, not that we are a business, we are not geared towards money, we're geared towards people, right? Everyone's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> if you think differently, just talk to me later, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we are invested in people, right? That's not like new knowledge for anybody. Um, and so our product is mature people. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of model of discipleship that Jesus laid out, um, how that fits into the epistles, how that fits into churches and cultures, and uh, then what do we do about it? Um, because what's hard, in, just to be honest, like what's hard in people's minds is when we study theology, let's just talk about um, an attribute of God like his uh, omnipotence. 
God is like all powerful. He is all, all the power comes from him, all the power flows through him, and all the power returns to him. You know, and the power we have as human beings is, is not like his. And so we understand things theologically, and the first product that the Lord wants us to, uh, or wants to produce in us is, is awe and glory back to himself, right? Create uh, worship, create spirits and hearts that worship the Lord. And uh, then after that, we're like, okay, what do we do about it? What do we, now that I have this knowledge of God, uh, besides just like singing a couple songs on Sunday morning, what do I do, right? And so for a lot of us, it's hard to take that uh, and figure out what is that like next step um, if we emphasize theology and biblical studies and all these things, um, which we do. And then sometimes it's just hard for us as people to say, okay, what do I do about that? What's the, uh, what do I have to do next, right? Um, which sometimes is the right question and sometimes is not the right question, but we'll get into that later. Uh, the first answer is always glorify the Lord, worship him and serve him. But, so our theme verse that I'm using, the only verse that, uh, if you're following with my Sunday morning teachings, the only verse that I'm repeating is Colossians 1, 8, I'm sorry, 1, 28 and 29. Which says, In him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. And so, um, one of my hopes is uh, I might put these on a sheet or something um, next week I'll, or next time I do Sunday mornings, I'll do scripture sheets, but uh, as a resource. Um, but today we're doing the foundational book list. Uh, but one of those scripture sheets I'll make, if you're following any of my teachings on Sundays, which probably one of you, two of you, two of you are, and uh, is all of the Bible verses we're going to talk about lead to epistemology or knowledge uh, about God's knowledge and about what our knowledge is. And so all of that ties together. And so every Sunday that I'm up here, I give about five or six uh, very poignant Bible verses about knowledge and what is our responsibility to knowledge and how do we get more knowledge. And so uh, you can jot those down and write those down in your notes or whatever, research them later. Um, I'm very encouraged. Uh, I'm, I don't know if uh, the right terminology would be a realist. You might think what I'm about to describe as a pessimist, but it doesn't matter whatever label you put on there. Um, is that I'm very encouraged that when I get up here on Sunday mornings and I'm, I know uh, not everybody is here on, at the 9.30, right? When we sit down here for 10.30, we get about the other 50% of people that attend our church. And for whatever reason, that's okay. Um, for in my, it's not okay, but, it's, <laughs> but for what I'm about to say, uh, it's okay in my eyes because I know uh, that I'm really only talking to a couple people who are really going to get it. That's not okay, though. Uh, and so when we're going over these practical things, I've been very encouraged that every time I get up here and I say, you can invite yourself over to my house, we can talk about evangelism, we can talk about the uh, articles, I can print them out for you, I'll make a scripture sheet for you, um, we'll do, I'll do whatever you want to make it easier and more accessible for you so that you can grow. And every time I say that, and go into a topic like the book list that we're going to do today, somebody comes up and says, hey, can you help me? And that's encouraging to me, because if nobody was doing that, I would be really sad. Um, and there'd be something majorly wrong, and it might be a problem with me, but it, it might not. It might be my style or something. Um, it might be that everyone is already more mature than I think. That would be amazing. Um, but anyways, I'm very encouraged that like when, you know, there's been people that have, uh, and I'll say it again, on any of these topics with any help, anything I can do for you, you can invite yourself over to my house. My wife will make you dinner because you don't want me to make dinner. And she'll probably make dessert too. We can have homemade ice cream. We do it about every four to five days anyways. So there's always fresh batches of homemade ice cream. Um, and 
Uh, we can talk about topics, we can talk about theology, we can help you get started in any of these resources. I'll make you scripture sheets, we'll go over the foundational book list, we'll go over articles, um, whatever it is, uh, my household is an open door. And I'm guessing you can do that with just about anybody on our leadership team or uh, who's halfway mature. Um, and so, for just to make a couple other points before we get into the uh, into the scriptures, is that this is for heads of households. This isn't just for you individually to help you grow, because it's all about you. We are a community of people who uh, live in fellowship and community with one another to help each other grow. And the scriptures make that clear that you don't just grow to maturity uh, on your own, isolated in your room by yourself, studying. That is one method that the Lord uh, gives us to help us grow. But the community is, is a huge piece to it. And so heads of households, uh, single brothers households, single sister households, moms, dads, uh, whatever, for you, this is supposed to help you to, to, to lead other people, to make disciples to, in very practical steps. Um, use these resources as just like a matrix of like where, where we're going, right? We all know the saying, if you, um, uh, if you don't, what's that? Well, man, just came into my head and I lost it. What's that saying? You guys can talk back to me. Uh, when you don't have a plan, uh, when you fail to plan, you're planning to fail, right? That's a truthism out there. And so this is all about just like helping everybody mature, right? Colossians 1 says that everybody that Paul um, is, is teaching Christ and warning everybody and teaching everybody that he might present everyone mature. And so everybody has an equal opportunity to be a mature Christian, right? Everybody has uh, uh, the same opportunity. Now, you might say, well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't do this. Uh, my dad wasn't a pastor. Well, either was mine. Um, and so you can make a tons of excuses that might say that it's unfair, and that might be the truth. Uh, it might not be fair, but everybody has the equal opportunity, and it is equally important to see um, that Paul makes no excuses for anybody, um, whether they grew up in a pagan culture, whether they visited temple prostitutes for most of their life, or whatever. Everybody can be mature. He doesn't limit that. Um, and so that word mature is, I'm using the ESV, and so the word mature in the King James is, is translated perfect, but the Greek word is, is teleos. So what is teleology? We'll throw this one out there. Teleology. The end goal, the purpose, right? Um, so it's that the purpose for all of us in Christ is to be mature. It's not just that we each have an equal opportunity, but Paul's saying that is the purpose of which Christ redeemed us and he created us is to be mature Christians, right? It's not just that we all have an equal opportunity and like, you know, um, like we do vocations. Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, church assistant and this guy does plumbing and this guy is a PhD doctor or something uh, or a girl or uh, this guy's an engineer, doesn't matter, right? It's not like we all have this equal opportunity to become something and it's all different. In certain analogies, that's true. But when it comes to maturity, everybody's purpose is maturity. There's nobody who is in Christ who he isn't wanting to be mature, right? Hopefully that's not new news, but we have to really understand that because um, everybody is called to it. And so the reason why I'm doing the practical things, like we're going to go over the foundational book list today, and usually I leave myself like between three to eight minutes to do the, like what I gave you an outline on the book list, but I'm going to try to leave myself more time. But the reason why we do practical things is because um, I think everyone's experienced this, right? Like um, I can uh, take a math course and I can look at videos, right? And, but if I don't ever practice it or if I don't ever do it and grasp it with my own hands, 
it's going to be very hard for me to actually say I have an understanding of these math concepts, right? And then what is every high school kid who doesn't want to do math? It's like, why are we learning all these things? What's the purpose? When am I going to use it, right? When am I going to use calculus? When am I going to... Uh, short little sidebar, because I like sidebars, uh, is I remember when we were at the old church and we were remodeling, um, and there was a, 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 the entryway. You guys remember that at the old church building? There's the four-year way. There's the, you come in the first double doors. There's two doors, on the one door on the left, and there's another double door, and there's that four-year way. It's not square, and there's, um, I think there was one light sort of in the middle, and we were remodeling, and I had to find out, like, where to put these other lights, and I had to use Pythagorean's theorem to figure it out. And I was like, oh, this is, what, this is why I went to high school and learned Pythagorean's theorem, so that I could remodel the church for your way and put in the lights in the right spot to make it uh, somewhat even. And so, uh, so with all these things, you might be thinking, uh, with the practical things, why do we need this? It's because when Paul says that we're teaching everybody with all wisdom, what the scriptures don't do is give us a step-by-step -step guide how to bring somebody to maturity, as in, well, have them read this, and then have them read this, and then if you come up with this issue, then the answer is this. We're working with people. We're dynamic creatures. We're made in the image of God. Um, each person is intricately different from everybody else. And so the scriptures were never intended to be a step-by-step -step field guide or manual to bring somebody to maturity, right? There's several, uh, there's tons of instruction, there's tons of commands, there's tons of uh, promises, but never was it intended to say, okay, here's step one, and here's step two, and here's step three, and you have to do them in this order, and when someone's done this, then they're a real Christian, and when they've done this, this is how they've reached maturity, right? It's not just checking off different things. And so it becomes extremely practical talked about that the other week with the foundational articles. Of, those are just articles, short um, little abbreviations to topics that you can uh, breach in about like 15 minutes or less just to help you open up your mind to a new concept or something maybe biblically you haven't quite uh, dove into yet. And so... Uh, Make no mistake, when Paul was in like Ephesus for 18 months, um, he wasn't just like standing on the street corner and preaching and then some people wanted to hear more and become Christians and he talked to them on Sunday mornings and preached and then sent them home uh, to come back next week, right? Uh, he labored, he met with people, he had teams with him, uh, he probably met with them daily, you know, around his work schedule because he was bivocational um, and... Right? And so it becomes extremely practical to bring someone to maturity, and it has to be done in wisdom. There's no step-by-step -step guide, right? And it's more like, uh, there's not, the majority of us aren't parents in this room, but those of you who know anything about kids, um, or, or even who took the counseling course, you can take that counseling course on like how to raise kids, you can read all the best books, but uh, that'll help you open up your mind to certain top topics, and um, things maybe you need to correct in your parenting, but it's not going to give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to raise a kid, right? Uh, that's just how it is. And so when we're, when we're talking about discipleship and when Paul talks about bringing someone to maturity or presenting people mature in Christ, it has to be done in wisdom. It has to, it's going to meet itself out in the practical ways, right? We have to get the big picture, the 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 overarching topics and, and different things, but for each individual person, it's going to be like a, what do we do next? we got to think about it. we got to pray about it. What would be good for this person? And that's why we're part of, and we are a shepherding movement that does one-on-one -on -one discipleship so that we can really makes it easier for us to meet those things out in practical ways. And so, there's the first Bible verse. we got five more to go. Uh, <laughs> right? And so just think about this. I'm just kind of throwing this out here before we get to the foundational book list. Um, when you read in Matthew 28, 20, the Great Commission that says, go and make disciples of all nations, a lot of times we divorce in our mind that, Paul, or, uh, Paul, that Jesus said this, and that's the Great Commission, and then 
the apostles did that, and we don't hear much about them, and then we kind of divorce in our mind the epistles from making disciples. Right? Does that kind of make sense where I'm going with that? And so, um, and we would think maybe, at least if you guys think how I've thought before, of when the disciples go out and plant churches and, and do things, that was them making disciples, but then how they wrote the letters and followed up with them was not, right? Or it's not easily you know, prevalent in our minds. And so, but um, just like Acts 1-8 brings out, you know, that says, when Jesus says, like, wait in Jerusalem, for then you will receive power from on high, and then you'll be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem until the ends of the earth. Well, the whole book of Acts is about that, right? This is what they did. And uh, up until their death, they were all about that, being witnesses to Jesus and making disciples. So uh, when the epistles are written, and all of the New Testament scriptures are written, it's about making disciples, right? So we don't want to divorce that from our minds of how, how the New Testament writers are uh, writing and the direct command from Jesus was to make disciples. And so I bring that into play because uh, we're going to read 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. This was one, uh, as a new Christian about eight years ago who lived a life of debauchery, I love this Bible verse because uh, in, in my mind, very practically speaking, I was like, okay, this tells you things to focus on, and I can do that, right? I just need like something to keep my mind straight, All right? So 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement, in the ESV, the NASB says, applying all diligence, like do this really, really give everything you got, uh, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there, stop. These qualities, pursue these qualities. We'll get into how to understand them or what they mean you know, uh, in a little bit, but he says very quickly, very briefly, pursue these qualities. These are the qualities that are going to keep you from being unfruitful and unproductive. Right? So that's huge. Right? Don't... Uh, don't gloss over what Peter says. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Uh, you know, I was, um, grew up in the church, was, had no fruit in Christ, was not a, a genu genuine, regenerate Christian, and I was tired of uh, falling. <laughs> it hurts, right? Uh, uh, like when, for both my daughters, for Lily and Mariah, when I taught them how to ride their bike uh, and when it started to get to the point where they removed their training wheels, they would be like wobbling and falling, right? And I'd be like, well, if you're tired of falling, I'm going to teach you, put your feet down. If you feel like you're going to fall, start using your brake, Right? And because it's not natural for them, uh, you know, on kids' bikes, you have to pedal backwards for brakes. And so it's not natural. When they freak out and they think they're falling, they're going to put their feet down. And if they're going too fast, their foot's going to catch, and that's going to cause them, and they're going to turn their bike over and fall. And they don't want to ride their bike anymore because they keep falling. Well, if you're tired of falling, pump the brakes, right? They, like, I had to teach them both that as we remove the training wheels and we're going faster, you need to start learning to teach yourself to pedal backwards and the brakes will be on, they'll slow down, and you won't fall, right? That's what Peter's saying. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. If you're tired of falling, if you're tired of being unfruitful and unproductive in the Lord, focus on these, right? Uh, verse 11, for in this way, they will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, we don't preach legalism. We don't preach that uh, apart from grace, you could be saved, or apart from grace, you could mature, or apart from grace, you could do anything in the Lord, right? He's saying if you're, you're going to make your calling and election sure, 
um, the very uh, premise of for this very reason in Peter, you can read verses uh, 3 and 4 that says that um, we have the knowledge of Christ, we have these promises, uh, and that he has given us every, everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, right? His, his precious and very great promises. Because we have everything, because Christ is pouring out everything on us, he's already given us grace, therefore we can practice these qualities. These qualities are not going to save us, right? They're not going to save us in the sense of, uh, of, of humanism. If I do this, then I will be set free from depression, anxiety, low self-image, uh, whatever, you know, whatever, um, or certain besetting sins, right? It's because we have the promises, because we have the grace of God, we can therefore practice these qualities and bring us into fruitfulness in the Lord. And so these qualities aren't, um, although a lot of uh, 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 church historians and theologians capstone qualities of, of faith and love as the two end stones, um, but these aren't like, oh, I got faith, now um, I, need to, I need to practice uh, like virtue, I need to like work on my moral character. And then once I've perfected that, then I'll go to knowledge. And then once I have all the knowledge, then I can go to self-control, <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. All of these are to be increasing at all times. And so we gloss over, um, we gloss, I just think in those, uh, even, you know, when I took these uh, and kind of made these like the verses of my life or for a period of time, I kind of glossed over knowledge too, right? Because you're like, knowledge, okay, what should I study? <laughs> and you're like, I don't know. Uh, well, that's why we're here, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's why we have a foundational book list. Um, we're not talking about studying mathematics. We're not talking about studying the sciences. The Lord's not saying, Peter's not saying um, that if you study philosophy in the Western tradition and if you study math and science, then you're going to be fruitful and productive in the Lord, right? What are you studying? Well, the things he pre-qualified that with, uh, all things that pertain to life and godliness, uh, through the knowledge of him, uh, his precious and very great promises. And so um, we generally think, to think about theology, uh, but that's not necessarily the end of it. Theology is just the beginning, right? Um, uh, there's in the King James, there's a proverb out there somewhere that relates in the paraphrased King James version in my head, says... Uh, so a man thinketh, so or as a man thinketh, so he is, right? And so I'm just using that verse to say that the Bible purports that uh, in our mind starts ideas and those produce fruit. And so that's how the gospel is practically met in the world. People preach with words those ideas through uh, start infecting their heart and the Holy Spirit uses those words that people preach to change lives. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty powerful. Um, he does, and he changes whole cultures, right? And so these aren't, these aren't necessarily sequential. They're all supposed to be increasing, and we rarely think of knowledge. Um, and so, again, I like to talk to you people. Uh, what's, somebody give me an overview. What is Second Peter all about? The whole book is about, like, one thing. Anybody bold enough to just shout it out? Jesus. It is about Jesus, but what is uh, Peter particularly addressing? Right, he's reminding them about some of the higher things, right? And one of the first things he addresses is false teachers, right? Uh, he says, he goes on for about two and a half chapters about like, here's the qualities of false teachers, and this is what you should look out for, and here's how you identify them. He doesn't name anybody by name. Uh, uh, Paul does in his writings. <laughs> and, uh, and I think in one of the, one of the, uh, one of the Johns, but, um, but Paul does. For he doesn't name anybody by name, but he says, watch out for people like this. This is what they're doing. They're going to lead you away from Christ, right, with these teachings, Right? 
So if you don't think that studying and knowledge and gaining a greater depth of what the Lord is doing is important, um, then read Second Peter. Right? It's he's he's very clearly the first thing he warns them about is false teaching, and so, um, you know, so he there's blatant false teachers. There's that lead him away, like uh, like Arians and things in the first couple centuries, the heresies that arose um, that that Paul predicts or prophesies that will come so that the way of truth will be known. Um, But I'm just going to throw out there uh, of why the foundational book list, why these resources, why these things are so important is because there's blatant false teachers out there we can go to uh, uh, that are in the name of Christ, like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons who are Christian cults, who are blatant, right? We're not, I'm not, so I don't think, uh, I think those are dangerous, but I don't think that's what we're concerned about here is becoming, becoming Mormons. Is anybody in, anybody in danger of becoming a Mormon next week? Let me know. Uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk at lunch. Uh, but what is, I think, prevalent and what is kind of more nefarious and unseen is just low theologies and low expectations that affect our church affect the Western church, affect our culture, and that slowly lead us away from Christ. And I don't, I'm not saying this because that's all those churches out there, and that doesn't affect us. I'm saying what happens, uh, what sin does to us is, is, and what Satan wants to do is a slow progression so that we don't even notice that we've been focusing on works and we've been led away from life in the spirit and we've been led away over multiple years from a genuine, uh, passionate love for Christ uh, and his mission as the church. And so that's our concern. That should be everybody's concern because we can have an appearance of maturity uh, like in Matthew 13, Luke 8, Mark 4, the parable of the sower, the third seed grew up to be a, this mature-looking tree, right? It was big. It had leaves. It filled the garden, but it had no fruit. It's youth, useless. It's good for firewood. It can't even produce another seed that could hopefully produce fruit in another tree, right? Um, and so there are certain things uh, in our hearts and there are certain things in our lives that lead us away from maturity. So it's something that we have to continually think about, um, and, and go after. And so uh, we've got two more Bible verses, and then we're getting into the practical thing. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they should be found faithful. Uh, Paul is saying the same thing in 2 Timothy 2, 2. The things which we have heard from me, the things which you have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. So we're not entrusting uh, things to just be written down and passed down, and hopefully someone will get it later down. We are entrusting these to, to people. That's how the gospel is entrusted. That's how the mysteries of God are entrusted. That's the, one of the glories of God, is that he is God, and he has entrusted uh, worthless, uh, selfish, sinful people to be entrusted with the greatest promises and the greatest means of grace in the earth. And it's our, it's our job to uh, be faithful, figure those out, uh, seek the Lord, and then pass those down. And so, grab your book list, your foundational book list, in the last 10 minutes. Um, and so, we have, this is just another resource we provide to help everybody grow. Um, these books are free in the library. You can check them out. You don't have to buy them on Amazon. You can check them out in the library and return them. You could also buy them downstairs. You can, uh, if you don't know where the library is or you don't know how to use it, because there are a lot of other books in there, you can see my wife, Noelle, in the lobby. She's the librarian, uh, and she knows where that's all at. Ask me, I can take you down there, um, right? So Josiah created another resource that I saw this morning, which is more like a checklist, and it shows you which books are on Kindle, how long they are, how many pages. And so, uh, because you might look at this and say, well, I want to start small. And I don't know where to start small, because then I'd have to get all these books and size them up and compare the pages and see which ones have big words and little words. And uh, that's a lot of work, so I guess I'll just not do that. 
right? I can tell you, well, Josiah's resource will help you with that. I can tell you where to start. Your discipleship group leader will tell you where to start. Any of the elders or leaders on our leadership team can tell you where to start and can help you, right? We, again, we're not a movement, we're not a church that says, here, you go take this, go home for a week, come back, don't report, just give a thumbs up, you know, to make me feel good and pretend like you're mature, right? Or the, one of the gifts that uh, Christ gave to his church is shepherds who care for the sheep. We just want to help you. Um, I don't know who cares for everybody um, that's here today, but you can, you're more than welcome to talk to me afterwards, invite yourself over to my house, have dinner, we'll eat ice cream. If you don't like ice cream, pity's on you. You can watch me eat ice cream, and we'll figure something out for you, um, and we'll talk about it. We could, uh, and that's all you have to do, and we'll do the rest. Um, well, we can't, we won't read it to you, but that's what book groups are for. Uh, and so each one of these has been designed. Another disclaimer, uh, there's like eight disclaimers, so <laughs> sit tight. Another, uh, this really isn't a disclaimer, is that each one of these has, we've chosen books. It's sometimes they, there's books that go off and come on. We keep it to a list of 12 so that you can read them in a year. They're not huge volumes, and they're not above a, a normal public American high school reading level. That means everybody, they're accessible to everybody, right? Um, everybody that comes here. I don't know if this, uh, and that also means, you know, all the people that we regularly talk with and regularly know, uh, as far as I know, this is accessible for everybody. Um, and there's other book lists that are a little bit more academic. Uh, and so, third disclaimer. Um, just as you read these, um, they're meant to go, there's 12 books, so you can read one a month for a year. Some of them are shorter and easier to read, uh, but they're all easy to read. And, but just because we put this on the book list, it doesn't mean that uh, we agree with every single word and line and jot and tittle that's in the book. We're talking about big concepts. Just like the articles were just meant to, hey, why don't you think about this? Why don't you think about like how deeply you actually think you know the gospel? Why don't you think, um, why don't you rethink what discipleship is? Why don't you rethink what the church is? Uh, those are just like things you can read in 15 minutes that'll hopefully the Holy Spirit will spark in your mind. Oh yeah, I haven't thought about that as deeply as Christ wants me to think about it. And so that means uh, you read the article, it's 15 minutes tops, and you're like, what do I do now? Um, and so I'd point you to this resource, uh, the foundational book list. And so... Um, let's just go through these real quick in the next uh, five to eight minutes. And I'm just going to give you a really quick overview. And so if uh, you can use this list and you can check it off and keep track, just like we suggest, many people suggest in their Bibles of making like tick marks to what books they've read uh, to keep track of it, to, to figure out what you haven't read, right? Um, I would do like a side story, but we don't have time for side stories. Uh, we do after lunch though or during lunch. And so God's big picture, tracing the storyline of the Bible by Vaughn Roberts. If you don't understand, and if you don't get that the Bible is 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, and they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit, written over a course of about 2,000 years by, uh, I think, 40 different authors. But there's one main, God is the author, he has inspired the scriptures, and they're not, none of these books are disconnected. No Bible verse is disconnected from any other Bible verse in the entire Bible, right? They are all interwoven. And so if you don't know the big story, the, or even just the timeline, the historical timeline of the scriptures or the major themes, like what is God trying to uh, show us here, what does he want us to understand, that's a good place to start because um, reading the Bible takes about a year at a normal rate with people with jobs or go to school, uh, 12 to 18 months. But if you want to uh, read scripture and supplement with a book that would help you to understand the bigger picture of the Bible, that's a great place to start. Uh, today's Gospel, Authentic or Synthetic, Walter Chantry. Uh, we use that. That's a short book. Uh, he goes over the, um, the account where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks him, 
Uh, what does he have to do? And so he uses that account in the Gospels to just start to question the gospel that we're preaching today that we've heard, that we've lived in, uh, just to show out there, it just might be a little bit more watered down than, than you suppose. And I'm, I mean for everybody. I don't mean <clears throat> for those churches out there. I mean for us. And so do you really understand the gospel? That's a good book to start. Basic Christianity, John Stott. It's a little bit thicker. I think it's like 150 pages or something. Um, 120, big print, shorter. Yeah, and so that's, an easy, that's another easy read of like, what, is, what do we believe about Jesus? What do the Gospels say? Right, this is like Orthodox Christianity. Um, I didn't grow up in a church that recited any creeds, so I was never taught any doctrine. I didn't care, I didn't listen anyways. Uh, so that's my fault. Uh, maybe they were teaching something good, probably. Uh, should have been listening, but, but I didn't have a heart for it or care. But Basic Christianity by John Stott is just a good introduction to what is like basic Christian beliefs that every Christian believes, right? Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer. Uh, if you do anything as just homework this week, I frequently, maybe once a year or something, uh, read just the introduction, where back in the 60s, A.W. Tozer is purporting as a theologian in America, from Canada into America, of that, um, that the culture is on the decline and the churches are, uh, are steadily getting worse and worse and less gospel-centered and affecting the culture worse uh, 50 years ago. And if you think it's gotten better since the 60s, again, come over for dinner. Um, and then he's saying because of our, our knowledge of God, even in, from basic theology in churches, is, is so low. And that was 50 years ago, and I would say that that problem um, has increased. I, I actually just read a study. It was by, like, Arizona Christian University um, where the, they polled a certain number of people. I don't know how they did the poll, but it was, like, 67% of Christians that they polled uh, claimed to be Christians. 60, 67% of people they polled claimed to be Christians. Of that 67%, only 9% of who claimed to be a Christian had a biblical worldview of like what the Bible says and a knowledge of what Christianity and what Jesus has purported. 9%. And so if you think you're above that or you think you're better than that, uh, you may be, but it's worth studying. But that's the culture we live in. Um, there's very little knowledge of, of God, of the Bible out there and just in our churches. And it's as a discipleship shepherding movement it's, it's not our goals to put that on other people or say other churches or we I don't care about that uh we work with people we work with everybody we want to see everybody that the lord has entrusted to us come to maturity which is you and people at the 10 30 when they're here um total forgiveness experience a study guide to repairing relationships by rt kendall uh you could read total forgiveness which is his his book the experience is a practical worksheet of what are some areas in my life uh, that I need that I have bitterness and unforgiveness that I haven't pressed out right um uh and we can go into uh, we have bible sheets on forgiveness we have bible sheets on bitterness and, and what it does to you um there's a, a great sermon in our on our uh podcast about uh, just titled forgiveness is the prerequisite to discipleship um and so that, and so that's huge. If you haven't worked through any bitterness or unforgiveness um, <clears throat> in your life, uh, that's a great place to start. Yeah, and then, then we have another one on true and false forgiveness. I think I'll do the Bible studies practical resources next week, or not next week, but next time I'm up here. And so, <clears throat> biblically, what is true forgiveness and what is false forgiveness? Right. Uh, in the next four minutes, we'll try to get through the rest of the list. Church membership, how the world knows who represents Jesus. Jonathan Lehman, I would put out there, just me personally, I think um, out of all our theologies out there, one of our lowest theologies in the West is ecclesiology or what is the church. And so that'll help you get a better idea of Christ's mission for the church, what is its purpose, and how do we identify with Christ. Um, 
Uh, the Disciplined Life, The Marks of, Christ, of Christian Maturity, Richard S. Taylor. Uh, I read that every year, every January. Uh, every January, it is extremely helpful to me. Um, if, you're, if you're pietistic, if you're more uh, Jesus is in heaven, ethereal, and he wants me to have a good heart, uh, read this book. Um, and it's not just if you struggle with being a disciplined person with like making your bed or something. Uh, that's like the first thing he suggests. And, but I don't want to... Good. But I read it every. I read that every year because it's extremely helpful to me and it keeps me on track of um, what am I doing with my life? How am I actually, you know, working for Christ and and the gospel? Family worship. Joel B. Key, uh, extremely short book. I think that's like forty pages, and it's like you know, like one of those half books or something. Um, that's just really easy. You could read that in an afternoon. It's a quick uh, 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 idea opener, mind opener to like, hey. Um, like, I know I go to church, but, like, do I have any, like, personal responsibility in my home uh, to help my husband or wife or kids or roommates worship the Lord on a daily basis? Uh, might be something worth studying. Um, especially, there's a, well, I'll throw that in. These, this is just the easy ones. There's one by Jay Alexander, um, Thoughts on Family Worship, which is just as, like, diary entries on family worship through the ages. And uh, he was a... Uh, post-Puritan, um, who just made observations about how uh, just family worship changes the culture. But So, Family Worship um, by Joel Beakey, really short. The Holy Spirit in You, A Study Guide to the Spirit-Filled Life. Dennis and Rita Bennett, right? About how do we live a life if Christ is all about uh, you will see power from on high and then you'll be my witnesses eventually to the whole world. Uh, how do we live a spirit-filled life in Christ? How do we get more of the Holy Spirit? Can we get more of the Holy Spirit? How do we live a life that isn't all just uh, dry, this is what I do with my Christian life? Uh, uh, in one minute, I do have a sidebar. I talk to the guy. I love going to right state and talking to people because you meet new people and they talk uh, when they do talk. And I like talking. Um, and he was like, man, one of the main qualms I have with Christians, and he's a Christian, uh, is that like, there's people out there that say they love Jesus and they just, they just got no passion. I'm like, yeah, man, I feel it. I get it. Let's go wake them up or something. Um, but right, how do we live a spirit-filled life, as, as Jesus described it? Uh, an eschatology of victory, G. Marcellus Kick. Uh, we as a church don't say, you know, with all these things, as you have to believe this to be in good standing with us. Um, I, don't even, I don't even like using a lot of times certain uh, uh, theological terms because you already have a preconceived idea in your mind of what that means and that might not mean what I mean but as long as you have a view or as long as we're uh, on the same track in one mind that uh, Jesus' church is going to storm the gates of hell we are going to be victorious the church isn't going to be defeated the gospel is wherever the gospel preached it will be fruitful um, then, then we're on the same track and so opening up your uh, ideas to go a little bit deeper onto what is the, the mission that we're here? What's the end goal, right? What are we going to do? Uh, when Heaven Invades Earth, A Practical Guide to the Life of Miracles uh, by Bill Johnson. Um, I didn't put another disclaimer on there, but I, I guess I could have. Uh, just because we like one book from one person doesn't mean we like books from or theology from everybody. I know some people in here might take qualms with uh, a few of these theologians and people. Um, we can talk about that. Again, we're open to talking. Uh, we love talking. Um, but that's about like, how do we live? Like when Jesus said, uh, like when he said, you'll receive power from on high and when the disciples went out and Paul did miracles, Peter did miracles, other people like Stephen who aren't named as apostles did miracles and as proof that the gospel is powerful, that Jesus is alive, that the resurrection is real and that the living, the living Lord Jesus Christ reigns here now, fills us with his spirit and he is just... Uh, doing things, right? Uh, how do we live a life of, of and not just being filled with the Spirit in our pietistic ways, but how do we live a life in the Spirit the way the disciples did, right? Um, that's a good thing to press out. And lastly, Francis McNutt's Deliverance from Evil Spirits. Um, of another introduction, uh, a basic study on deliverance, on 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 demons. You can call that demonology, I guess, if you want. Um, but are demons real? Do they still exist today? Where are they? What do we do about it? If you haven't thought about those, then maybe the Lord wants you to study that. 
uh, and press that out. And that's these, so these are good studies to, to start. Again, these are just starting guides. This is how we can practically help people. Um, this is one resource that we use on a regular basis. We put it in our visitors' packets because we even want to say, hey, we just want to help you come to maturity. We want to do what we can. We will... I can't make you read books. I can't make you want to study. I can't make you read the Bible. I can't make you get on a Bible reading plan. I can't uh, make you want to get baptized in the Spirit. I can't, I can't make you do anything, right? Unless I uh, put you in a headlock and make you submit or something. Even then, you don't want to do it, and it's not going to be any, any fruitful. Um, and so this is just a resource we're throwing out there that we say we want to help you grow. We want to bring you to maturity. These books... Um, Open your mind to something deeper that's biblical, right? You have to become a reader. You have to become um, a man or woman who, who loves knowledge, who seeks knowledge, who increases knowledge. And in our culture, I'm not talking to people out in, uh, in um, West India. I'm only talking to people in Southeast India on the video cast. Uh, and I know all of them. And uh, uh, a quick welcome if they're watching to our brothers and sisters in Vijawada, who is a little bit farther north, uh, northwest. Um, but I know everybody here, everybody knows how to read, everybody has the capabilities, and we're trying to increase the knowledge of God. Everybody could read books, and they're all palpable. And if you think it's hard, I think you're right. But we're here to help. Um, and come over to my house, and we'll eat ice cream and talk about it. And so, again, these are, this is just one other resource that we want to help you grow in. And you can grab it. You can attain it. Uh, it is doable. Um, I'll save side stories for a few weeks, whenever I'm talking later. But I was never a studious person until I became a Christian or academic person. And so it's only been eight years. And so let's end in prayer. Uh, Father, we just uh, beseech your grace that you'd pour on us uh, the, the, um, the precious promises and knowledge of our Lord, uh, of Jesus Christ, of the knowledge of him, the power of him, the glory of him uh, that you bestow us. Cause us to think in the, about these things, to press them out, to increase in, in faith, in virtue, in knowledge, in self-control, uh, and brotherly affection and steadfastness and, and in love so that we would be fruitful Christians for your kingdom, Lord, in every area that you've called us to, in every way that that means, through your grace and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, Grace Christian Fellowship. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, We have a few announcements. The first one is uh, we have a weekly RCF Alpha course going on. If you don't know what an Alpha course is, ask Deanna. (laughs) It's going to be Thursdays at 7 p.m. at the condo. So if you're looking for a weekly meeting and you want to get connected with the church, then that's a great way to do that. Our next announcement is coming up one week from today is the annual church picnic. Yay! I know, try to hold your enthusiasm back. Uh, It's going to be following the Sunday service and we're of course going to, it's going to be here this year. So just want to make sure everyone knows and is not showing up at my house because then you won't get to eat all the delicious food. And of course, we'll have games and things for the kids. And this is uh, probably our most wonderful outreach opportunity. So if you are looking, if you've been wanting something to invite your friends to outside of GCF, this is a great way to do that. And our last announcement is we have one spectacular, awesome birthday this week. He's standing back there, Michael Ha. Birthday's tomorrow. So happy birthday tomorrow, Michael. And uh, that about wraps it up. So let us worship together. Let's stand for the call to worship from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord.
ask that as we sing this song that you would confirm your cleansing of us, of our hearts. That you would confirm your gospel that we are righteous in the sight of God because you have made us righteous. Lord, we ask that you would convict us of our sins and then wash us clean. Thank you. 
my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious gift, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my
Thank you for the truth of your word, Lord God. Thank you that you have taken our sin, our cross, our shame, and you rose again. We bless your name, God. We bless your name, Jesus. You hold the name above every name. God, we pray that you would be uh, Lord of our hearts, our lives, Lord of the church, Lord of this world. We pray that your spirit would go with us as we go out as ministers of your word, of your gospel. Empower us, God, by your Holy Spirit. We pray all of these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Since it's the first Sunday of the month, we're going to proclaim our faith as it has been handed down to us in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let us pray over our uh, tithes and offering, um, focused on a prayer from our scripture reading today. Amen. Holy Lord, maker of us all, you call us to love our neighbors as ourselves and teach us that faith without works is dead. 
Open us to the opportunities for ministry that lie before us, where faith and words and the need of our neighbor come together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, help us to do that with these gifts, these offerings you give you to proclaim your kingdom uh, throughout the week with what you've given us. Let us be good stewards. Amen. Please stand for the reading of God's word. This morning, I will be reading from the New American Standard Bible. It's available behind me for you to observe it in the English Standard Version. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 35. Verses 4 through 7. Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The retribution of God will come. But he will save you. Then the eyes of those who are blind will be opened, and the ears of those who are deaf will be unstopped. Then those who limp will leap like a deer, and the tongue of those who cannot speak will shout for joy. For waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty grounds a spring of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Now Jesus got up and went from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted to know about it. He wanted no one to know about it. And yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing about him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician descent, and she repeatedly asked him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him and said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table Feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And after going back to her home, she found the child laying on the bed and the demon gone. Again, he left the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, within the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him one who was deaf and had difficulty speaking. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers in his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva and looked up to heaven with a deep sigh. He said to him, Ephathotha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed. And he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, 
but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. And they were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even those who are deaf hear, and those who are unable to speak, speak. This is the word of the Lord. I just actually want to pray for Deanna's parents, you know, Jeff and Roseanne Brown. They, uh, Deanna said today Roseanne's doing a lot better. Jeff's already back to school. Oh, I guess I need this. Huh? Probably not. Oh, for the video cast, maybe. Um, so, go to mention that when the first day Mr. Brown was back at the meeting, he looked like he was tired. So, <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I had the mildest case of COVID ever, not, not really, but I mean, I, but I, for whatever reason, I keep going like one day I'm great. The next day I'm way out of breath and, and feeling terrible and, and, uh, and very tired. And so, uh, let's, let's, you know, Jeff and Roseanne are such dear people and they're, they do so many important things. Let's just pray for them a minute. Thank you, Lord, for Jeff and Roseanne and, and uh, all they do for your church uh, in, 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 the, in the capital C or larger sense of the word, and, um, including us, Lord. And so we, we pray that you'd restore everything so they wouldn't have lingering symptoms of tiredness, of uh, ongoing uh, struggles for oxygen, uh, uh, we pray there would just be no residual effects uh, of COVID in their life when this is over, that within the next few weeks, uh, you know, Romans 8 is a great verse where it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, how much more shall he quicken life to your mortal bodies? And I've always kind of had this sense that one aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry is that, of course, he's in Genesis 1 in the creation, giving life. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters, and God said, uh, the Spirit of God wrote the scriptures. And uh, when man, Genesis 2, 7, that God took uh, man from the dust of the earth and uh, formed him, uh, and breathed into him the breath, the spirit of life, the breath of life, and he became a living being, a self-conscious soul. And um, so there's, uh, the, it's, you know, we, we talk about being born again is uh, a first filling of the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Spirit is a greater release. But really the first uh, filling of the Holy Spirit is being conceived and being born. It's the Spirit of God that gives life. And, and he, I, in the mystery of it all, an unregenerate person who doesn't know the Lord, uh, who's not filled with the Spirit of God, is actually made alive by the Spirit of God, and their life is being sustained by the Spirit of God. So we, we uh, pray that uh, you would bring a greater measure and anointing and release of the Holy Spirit into Jeff and Roseanne's life than they've ever known. Uh, that you would, that it would be growing steadily and gradually and that it would have physical health uh, ramifications as well as intellectual and spiritual growth implications. And that they would um, know you a God is spirit, those who worship must worship in spirit and truth, John 4, 23 and 24. Uh, we, we pray that as they uh, grow in the things of the spirit and the spirit of God grows in them, that all residual effects of COVID, uh, that it would help Jeff's whole, uh, his heartbeat and rhythm of his heart, and uh, that it would grant them a much higher quality of life and longevity of life uh, from this day forward, and that, and uh, 
We know you can do this, and we trust you to do this. Thank you for these, these dear people in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Um, well, let's open with uh, prayer. Our Lord, Almighty God, and our Father, the only Father we have ever known in the deep and permanent and true sense. Lord, you have given us many things. You've given us birth into physical life, uh, perhaps a parent or parents, perhaps uh, siblings. You've given us maybe a little money or a little health for a little while. And today we gather, we who are gathered in your name, anticipate a greater pouring out of your spirit upon us that the eternal life that is promised might be made more real and uh, and. Uh, that, that the eternal life might, um, that the Holy Spirit, who is the free gift of the water of life, might well up in our spirits resulting in eternal life, of course, but that we might experience a deeper and greater and sweeter fellowship with your spirit now, and therefore uh, deeper and greater and more pleasant fellowship with one another. We pray for power to... Um, see our sin. We pray for power to war against the sin that the flesh loves. We pray for power to have hope in him who has overcome, who has overcome sin and the devil, and who reigns forevermore, and who even now is interceding for us on our behalf standing at the right hand of the Father praying for us. And it is him we have gathered to worship. Please open our mind to understand this scripture. We thank you for Romans chapter 6, and we pray that the reading of Romans 6 today would be a bondage breaker. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. You have a special guest speaker next week. He's not here today. His name is Daniel Williams. He'll be preaching on Romans 6, I think, 50, verse 15 through the end of the chapter. Today, we're going to set him up for a home run. Today, we're going to look at, in our study of Romans 6, we won't go too deep. We're going to focus on three paradigms or perspectives or lenses through which we must look at Romans 6 or else we will not understand it. So, if you're taking notes, please do. Would everybody except for Sydney please write down the following? Sid, you don't have to. Yeah, trust me, you're not going to forget it. <clears throat> Salvation, identity, and dominion. If we don't understand biblically, those are Sidney's initials, that's the joke. If we don't understand Romans chapter 6 through the lens of what is biblical salvation, and biblically, what is our identity, and biblically, what is dominion and what does that have to do with us, then it's very easy to make the mistake that we will see in a few moments. Without further ado, I'm going to begin a couple of verses back at Romans chapter 5. Remember we talked about the first Adam and the last Adam. We talked about the family tree. We all descend from the first Adam and therefore we're all born in sin, like it says in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. Not saying my mother was in sin when I was conceived, but rather everyone is a sinner from the womb, right? And then we talked about Christ who powerfully raises from the dead all those who were born spiritually dead. And all of us uh, rise to the Father because of him. A different kind of family tree. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men... So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now, 
the law came in to increase the trespass. Remember, um, like if there's no line to cross, you didn't cross the line, right? The law came in to increase the trespass, which is like crossing a boundary. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice those words, sin reigned and grace reign. Reign has to do with dominion or rule or kings and kingdoms, right? A king and the members of that kingdom. Okay, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We're going to come back to that. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Duh. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin, because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Okay, so think about it. Who wants to be a slave, right? Nobody raises their hand, okay? Um, so somewhere in there, the analogy breaks down. But we've got to use the language, even though it's natural language. But Paul says, bear with me. I'm speaking in human terms. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. 
For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Remember this morning Stephen talked about the, the telos, the, in Greek the end, right? It means the end goal or the end result. Like this is the trajectory on which one may be headed. The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, thank you, Lord. Remember our study of Romans chapter 1. We talked about the righteousness of Christ. We said the gospel is all about Christ and his righteousness and being united with Christ. And therefore, his righteousness and his holy life fills or spills over. Or uh, like Jesus, when he touched the leper and Jesus didn't contract leprosy, the leprous man became cleansed. When he indwells and lives in the believer uh, completely and through and through, both from that moment through life and ultimately after passing through the door of death, we are united with him in resurrection life so that his life works its way all through our spirit, soul, and body as individuals and a community of Christians so that we are saved. So, one possible error we can make when we read Romans chapter 6 is to think, um, I'm saved, so it doesn't matter. And we'll get to that. Paul is saying here that's a poor understanding of salvation. And I think if we can revisit what it means to be saved, Romans 6 will come alive to us and be more practical to us. You see, here's what we do. We read Romans 6, and it says then, you know, like Paul is trying to persuade us, it does matter what we do. And one of us might be over here thinking, I got saved, I am saved, I was saved. But then here, Romans chapter 6 is talking about a process of salvation and something that results in salvation. And that makes us stop and rethink, wait a second, am I being saved from hell to heaven? Because if I got saved and I'm saved from hell and I'm going to heaven and that's all the Christian life means, then it's hard to argue against a person who thinks that and convince them that it really does matter whether or not you sin a little or sin a lot, isn't it? That's, a, that's kind of an impasse, isn't it? Well, that person has a wrong view of salvation. So let's look at that. Another possible error we can make when we read Romans 6, as, as the Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul, and he's saying, Stop sinning because you died to sin and you've come alive in Christ and the result of holy living is the salvation of your souls and the end of being on that trajectory is eternal life. So therefore, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. One possible error we can make is to read that and be like, okay, I can do that and let your life, let your idea of working out your Christianity be trying hard not to sin and trying hard to do right and be holy. So that's a piece of the pie, but, we, but if that's how we think of Christianity, we've missed the big picture. In fact, 
our arrow has landed so far away from the bullseye that we will ultimately miss the target if we're thinking that way entirely. So, the, if, we, if we thought that way, that I need to try real hard to not sin and try real hard in my own strength to do what's right, and that that's what Romans 6 says, we'd be missing the point of the chapter and of the whole book and, of course, the Bible as a whole, and we would have become Pharisees. But righteousness, when we talk about the righteousness of Christ in the gospel, righteousness has less to do with doing the right things and more to do with being of one heart and mind with God, which always results in bearing fruit of righteous living. When we read Romans 6, we could say to our... Well, let me back up. We have said that this book is not primarily theological. It's relational. When we read Romans 6, we could say to ourselves, okay, I could do that, or I could try harder, or we could embrace our new identity in God. And that is what Romans 6 is about. It's about a change in identity. If we try hard to be righteous, and that's it, by our own strength, we will end up being both unrighteous and unloving. If we seek him first and answer his call to discipleship and belonging, we will find him and his righteousness. Romans 6 may not make much sense to you if you have a popular evangelical understanding of what it means to be saved. So we said, it's common for a person to have uh, a sub-biblical understanding of the gospel and of salvation. They, people may think, I believed, therefore I got saved from hell, and now I'm going to heaven. And that tends to result in a life full of sin, a life that, uh, that where the person isn't understanding their identity or their calling. And if you think in the way that, Romans, that Paul is thinking in Romans 6 about what salvation is, um, the life of God will lead to holy living. Paul says... In, uh, in verse, uh, let's see here. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, stop there. Paul has just used the word death and compared baptism and the salvation event to, to completely leaving everything behind like the disciples did when Jesus called them by the sea. We can't think of salvation as getting saved, like I got saved, I was saved. But when we take on the more holistic biblical understanding of salvation as, um, as both having been justified and of being saved from something that isn't hell, but it will result in being saved from hell, then we will be thinking biblically. Paul here is talking about, he's talking about being saved from myself. So think about how the, the disciples by the sea were saved, as we say, when Jesus called them. He called them, he said, follow me. And what was their answer? Did they say, well, first let me go take care of some family affairs. I gotta, you know, take care of, I gotta see to my father. And no. Did they say, well, yeah, teacher, we'll follow you wherever we go, wherever you go. And did Jesus say to them then, 
well, you know, foxes have uh, holes in the ground and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. No. Or did they come to him first and say, what must I do to receive eternal life? And did he say to them, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor and then come follow me and you will have eternal life? And then did they go away sad? No. Those are all examples of people who did not follow Christ. But too much of the time, our, our thinking about being Christians really looks like that. And that's what I want to challenge today. When Jesus called them by the sea, on that day and in that hour, they left their nets and their father and their boats and they followed him. And they went with him wherever he went. And they became children of God. But every morning after that, for all the years they were with him, and after his resurrection and ascension, every day they had a chance to go home, didn't they? So that call of Christ was a one-time altar call where they had faith in their hearts and they believed that God would, that if they trusted him, God would raise them from the dead. They did that day, but they also continued in that faith every day, like the faith of our father Abraham, who we talked about last time, right? It says Abraham didn't waver in his faith. He had lots of chances. Um, so every day the disciples woke up and they had a chance to go back. What I'm saying is that every day they heard the call of Christ to continue with him. And every day, they maintained, they continued to leave everything and follow him. Salvation, biblically, is less of a one-time altar call and more of hearing Christ's call to leave everything and to daily hear his call and go through the gospel process every day and to daily take up your cross and follow him. And there are a lot of different kinds of crosses we have to bear. But salvation is living and walking in and keeping in step with the Spirit. And the end goal of that is the salvation of our souls. So if that is a biblical pattern of discipleship or of salvation, what then were the disciples saved from? When I read that, how the disciples answered Christ's call, I don't come away thinking they got saved from hell and now they're going to heaven. That is like a minimalistic, reductionist, it's, it's missing Christianity entirely. Yet most of us were raised... Uh, uh, in that kind of thinking. I was. And I went to a good Christian church. You know what I mean? With good people who loved the Lord. And that kind of perspective was the perspective I ended up with. But biblically, salvation is from what? Christ was saving those disciples from themselves. When Adam said, in high-handed rebellion in the garden against the Lord, Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned. And he said, I think I'm going to decide for myself what's good and evil. And that is what we need to be saved from every day. We need to be saved from belonging to ourselves. The, the most popular religion in America today is... I create my identity, I determine my destiny, and I'm a good person. And we might even, some take that to there's something divine in me and there's something divine in you, which is like a counterfeit, uh, like false religion version of we're all created in the image of God, right? And, and the outworking of that kind of thinking is that you can't tell me what to do and I can't tell you what to do and you can have your opinions and they're right and good because they come from a 
good heart. I'm sure you mean them sincerely. And, and I the same. And, and nobody can tell me what to do or have dominion over me. Right? Salvation is from being ruled by our flesh. So let's look deeper at what the scripture says in Romans about what we're being saved from in ourselves. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So, body here. I have a, a physical body. It's got arms and legs. It's got members, right? Um, and body, the, the body into which I was born has a part, a part of my being or essence that is called in Romans the flesh. It's not just that part of me that isn't under the control of Christ. There's something in me that has passions and desires and I can be enslaved to my passions and desires. In American culture today, that's kind of a good thing. You know, they say, follow your heart. Uh, at my Bible college, there was a thing right over our cafeteria uh, serving line, follow your heart and your dreams will come true. And I remember looking at it and kind of squinting funny and thinking, that's not biblical. Well, it's so, that's a false religion and it replaces Christ with me. And that's what Adam did in the garden. And that is, there's something in me that wants to replace God with me every day, even after I got saved, so to speak. And every day, what Christ is saving us from is from that thing inside you and inside me that will be there until the day you die, that makes you, every day, want to rise up in rebellion against God and have your own way and decide for yourself what's good and evil. So we've talked a lot about Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. In that verse, heart, and the word Paul uses for this thing in me that needs to be killed to which I may be enslaved, that God is saving me from, has saved, is saving me from, and will save me from through and through, is my heart that is deceitful above all things. It's my flesh which has passions and desires. That doesn't mean here that everything a person wants or, or passionately desires is bad. What it means is that there's something in me that darkly, selfishly, um, manipulatively, controlling, abusively, using others, using God, using the world around me to satisfy myself, that's, that's in me, and it never goes away until you die. That's why Paul says, those who have died have been set free from sin. Sin is almost synonymous with self in this sense. Sin and, and flesh and the heart. There's this thing in me. Romans chapter 8. Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit is life and peace. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, Romans chapter 8, verse 7. So the flesh, that part of me, that is, uh, there's this thing in you and in me that is hostile to God. That's what the flesh is. It, this may be much darker and more evil and insidious than you were taught in church growing up, Right? Or, or we don't, part of the reason for that is not that we weren't taught it, because most of us heard the Romans road, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Most of us sat under that teaching if we grow up in church. But my heart 
is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And it's always trying to cover up its true motives and deceive me and others. And my flesh being hostile to God. So that means my, there's something in me that is an enemy of God. There's something in you that is at war with God. And it's at war against you. So there are like two, it's like two animals fighting or two people locked in a, in a fight to the death, right? But there's another person in my spirit, and it's Christ. And Christ, when I set my mind on Christ, when I seek first him and his righteousness and his kingdom, the end goal of that is that I don't obey the flesh with its passions and desires. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So it's not that I was saved, I got saved, I am saved, in the sense that that's all I need to know. Otherwise, we're going to have to have Romans 6 preached to us again and again and again, and we're not going to get much from it. We're going to be like, well, yeah, I can sin, I'm saved, right? That's, a, that's an error in our thinking of what salvation is. Salvation is salvation from me being my own Lord, Master, and God. Me having the right to determine my own destiny and set my own course in life. It's salvation from my sinful motives, desires, and passions. It's salvation from being self-deceived and also self-condemned. It's salvation from loving lawlessness and hating God. It's salvation from being hostile to God. In justification, our sins are taken away. That has to be practically worked out on a day-to-day -day basis of, of confessing and renouncing sin and finding mercy. And that's called sanctification or being made holy. We were made holy. We are being made holy. When we die, our bodies will be sown into the ground and raised and transformed into glorified bodies, and there will be no more sin, there will be no more flesh in our glorified bodies once we arise and are with him in his presence forever, if we're on this trajectory, right? In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says, Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. So it can't be, biblically, that I was just saved, once saved, always saved, in, in like this very small, and there's nothing more to it. Salvation has, I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. The Bible has a bigger vision of what salvation means. And Romans 6 help us, helps us to flesh that out in practical living, especially if we have a biblical vision that God wants to save my whole spirit, soul, and body. He wants all of me. Salvation looks less like answering an altar call and more like hearing the voice of Christ day after day after day and walking with him. Does that mean maybe here and there I'm faithless? What does the scripture say? Like, does that mean I lose everything? Well, Peter, um, after Christ was crucified and raised from the dead, one of his first thoughts was, I'm going fishing. And he tells some of the other disciples, I'm going fishing. It's faithless. I'm going back. And so he goes back to the Sea of Galilee, and he's out fishing, 
and it's there that Christ comes to him. This is why there are verses in the Bible, like in uh, Timothy, where it says, if we, are, if, if we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So this brings us into our second point, our second lens through which we have to view Romans 6, our identity. Romans 6 is not spoken to people who got saved and you're trying to persuade them, stop sinning and be good, and the response to that isn't, okay, I'll try harder now, right? That's not even Christianity. It has some echoes of Christianity, but shadows of it, but it's not the real substance. Your identity is that you're not your own. You're bought with a price. I have to go through the gospel process and remember that every day, right? I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. And it goes on, therefore, honor God with your body. You were made for God's glory. That's a statement of identity. You were created by Christ Jesus for Christ Jesus to be a son or a daughter of God, to be a brother or sister of Christ, to be a joint heir with him of salvation, leading to eternal life. That's the picture of eternal life that Romans is trying to bring out. And hell is, most of us probably have a less than biblical understanding of hell. Hell, there's, it, you know, Jesus uses the term the hell of fire, but he also talks about being cast into outer darkness. And it's those who are already born in sin and who are separated from the life of God, alienated from the commonwealth of the people of God, who are on a trajectory that leads to never being united with Christ. And if you're far from him, you're far from his presence. So if you're on that trajectory, then the end result is you're, you're living in separation from God, and the result of that is eternal separation from God. That gives us a little bit more full understanding of the biblical vision of what hell really is. It's eternal separation from God. It's eternal indulgence in the flesh, where one may be angrier and angrier about the things they used to be angry about, where one is more and more firmly convinced that I've just got to get my own way. And it's like, God will give you that. You can have your own way, right? But the result of that is death. And when we were living like that, what fruit did we get at that time for those things of which we are now ashamed? The time that is past suffices for living as it says the Gentiles do, as those who are separated from the life of God do. We've had enough indulgence in the flesh in the past. God is saving a people who belong to him by renewing our mind in the word, by the power of the Holy Spirit in relationships within the church to to every day go through the gospel process by the renewing of our minds, remembering, and then living out, bringing, putting, putting, putting shoe leather on it, walking it out, um, the, the new identity we have in Christ, that we belong to him. That's why the letter of Romans opens up with Paul, a bond servant or bond slave, or a once and for all committed devoted servant, and it was my choice. You made the choice to follow God when you, say, answered that altar call. But the call is all about the caller, and it's about rightly being rightly related with him day by day in such a way that you're renewed in your identity. And so we make it our aim to please him because 
He is our Father, a Father like we have never known before. The Father who is perfect. The Father who is righteous and blameless and in whom there is no fault. It's the Father we always needed. All of the good things about our earthly fathers are echoes of who he is. And united to him through his son Christ, we become, uh, the, the response isn't like a business transaction where, you know, the wages of sin is death, but, uh, but I got, I'm saved in Christ, and so I'll, you know, I owe him about this much because he paid that much. It's not a business transaction. It's a relationship into a family, into the family of God with God our Father and Christ our brother. And the response of that is gratitude. The natural response to Christ's gift, to the free gift of God, is warmth, affection, gratitude, and that grows into love. And out of being rightly related with Christ and being renewed in the image of our Creator every day comes holy living, the holy living that Romans 6 is talking about. And because we still struggle with sin, the Bible includes verses like, what we will be has not yet been made fully known, because sometimes I don't look like a saint. And because we still suffer, the Bible talks, Romans especially, gives us great hope for when we suffer. For if we suffer and are united with him in a death like his, we will surely also be glorified with him and we have this sure hope of a resurrection like his. The natural response to that isn't, good, I'm off the hook, I'm not going to get punished for my sin. The response to that is warmth and affection and gratitude. It's kind of like becoming human. It's becoming the humans we were created to be, personal and personable. And it's the warmth of our Heavenly Father's affection and the outstretched hand and the call of Christ that is ours to respond to every day that brings us into fellowship with Him. And in fellowship with Him, our hearts are renewed and we respond in faith and we love Him and we worship Him and it says we always do what pleases Him, right? And that is what we're being saved from and what we're being saved to. And that is our new identity. Rethinking salvation, rethinking identity day by day. And then finally, dominion. In Romans 6, we see the word reign and the word dominion again and again. It says, one who has been died has been set free from sin. We will live with him. Being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign. That means rule, have dominion over, or control. To make you obey its passions. Verse 14, sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. That means you're not stuck under the condemnation that the law brings to those who transgress or trespass the law. But I am under, one might say, undergirded by grace, and I'm empowered to love him. What we're being set free from in verse 14 is from being slaves to self and to the sinful desires that live in me to desiring Christ, to desiring God, and therefore willingly slaying as a uh, as a beast with a spear, putting to death that thing in me day after day that wants to have me. Like it says, uh, like God said to Cain in Genesis, he said, Cain, 
Why are you angry? And why is your face downcast? Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you or have dominion over you, but you must master it, but you must take dominion over it. And as you read Romans 6, that's what it's about. Um, We're going to summarize here. I'm going to kind of skip ahead. The theme of dominion and reign is repeated in Romans 6. And why is that? Is that a new concept in the Bible? Or has that been a main theme from the beginning? Genesis 128, And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's called the command to take dominion or the dominion mandate in in theology. So the people of God are to live in the world and to rule over all aspects of creation in Jesus' name for him on his behalf, for his glory, reworking the raw materials of creation until it is a cultivated garden in all the earth partly physically, literally, and partly in all areas of science and medicine, in all areas of, under, of government and economics. This is the dominion mandate that never went away to which we Christians are called. And when your expectation is that you are part of a team, a family, a people, called out of the earth, called out from among all nations, to be his holy possession. That's your identity, your belonging in him, and your community. Christ our Father, God our Father, Christ our brother, us brothers and sisters in every generation. And now we have a job to do, and that's what Romans 6 is about. It's not a pietistic, there's sin, there's sinful desires in me, and I've got a overcome them by my strength, it's the, the biblical vision of taking dominion is Christians taking dominion over sin, over the devil, over the whole world, and our expectation should be that all nations of the earth are going to be blessed through Christ, and that means by Christ through his people. As the gospel is exported into all lands, and as the world is Christianized, not in other religions at the point of a sword or, or by killing those who are your enemies, but rather by first me in my home every day answering the call of Christ and praying through the Lord's Prayer, Father, your will be done, your kingdom come. Your will be done as it is in heaven. How do the angels do God's will? They just do it, like the disciples at the seashore. So as we pray a prayer like the Lord's Prayer on a daily basis, we're working out our salvation, and we're being renewed as his image bearers, such that in my thinking, in my feelings, in my heart, Christ is the boss and the God and the Father, and I his Son. Affection warmth, gift, free gift of God that he continues to give me every day, even as I answer his call every day. And the result of that is eternal life. The dominion to which we are called has to be fleshed out in our lives, and in our lives that ebbs and flows a little. Because sometimes, like Peter, we are faithless. And yet, he is faithful, for he cannot renounce himself. Because our new identity in him is that he's written his name on our foreheads and on our hands, and that we belong to Christ. So my job in my family, as a father and as a husband, is to first answer the call and welcome the rule of Christ, the authority, the dominion of Christ, 
with no qualifications and not waiting any amount of time to think about it or to give him any, well, because my wife didn't, I'm not gonna. It doesn't work that way. So my job as a family man and your job as somebody who lives in a house with others is to welcome the reign of Christ in you and that has a fantastic spillover effect throughout your home as you welcome the presence of God, not just pietistically in a spiritual sense, but that, but also in how you speak to your children, to your spouse, in what thoughts you allow to remain in your mind. If Christ isn't saying them, you need to kill those thoughts. If Christ isn't speaking that kind of thing to my wife, then I'm not going to speak that way to her. If Christ isn't that kind of father to me, then I'm not going to be that kind of father to my kids, and I'm not going to demand or, or relate with them in a way that God doesn't relate with me. It's God's dominion being manifest in me, in my home, and us as a, fa a multi-generational family bringing the dominion of Christ to every aspect of schools, culture, economy, the arts, literature, science, um, every, every part of the world, being Christ, me being an image bearer of Christ and actually an ambassador to him, bearing Christ in me, both through the ups and downs of life and suffering and temptation and confession and repentance of sin, me daily, and the church, as sometimes we suffer under great oppression, and sometimes we enjoy something that, more look, that looks more like Christendom, where culture flourishes, and Christianization bears like, like flowering trees bearing fruit, more fruit than it had in other times in history. That has to happen more and more, and that's what we're working towards. When you view Romans 6 through the lenses of the biblical view of what we're saved from, of what our identity is, and the dominion to which we are called, and that command, that dominion mandate was never rescinded. It must continue until Christ has his way everywhere. Right? When you view it that way, it will be easier to respond in faith as you read Romans 6 and consider yourselves dead to sin. So your homework is to read Romans 6, slowly, thoughtfully, and through the lenses of the biblical view of salvation, biblical view of your identity, and biblical view of the dominion mandate. For there is no part of the world over which Christ doesn't cry, mine. And you are Christ, if indeed you are in him. And you, your job is to bring that reign of Christ into all the world and to let Christ reign over your sinful passions and desires and that flesh, that terrible thing that lives in you and slay it. Amen. Thank you. Let the servers of communion please come forward at this time.
one holy loaf in the Lord and feeding on the bread of life, even Christ. Amen. To him who has saved us by his blood and for his glory, amen. Please stand for our benediction. Thank you, Lord. Now, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And may you who belong to Christ be fully saved and sanctified and healed in him from self and sin and sickness and the devil, that you might be presented to him faultless on that day. Amen.